guys, welcome to your unit on neonatal jaundice and exchange transfusions. This video was prepared for PRAN 1502, Obstetric Nursing Theory, and Nursing 3051L, Care of the Infant and Children Lab. The American Academy of Pediatrics Subcommittee on Hyperbilirubinemia in 2004 defined jaundice or icterus as the yellow discoloration of the sclera and skin as a result of hyperbilirubinemia. To better understand jaundice, you have to be able to understand how bilirubin is processed in the body. This works the same for all of us, but the neonate can be delicate. Normal values for newborns is a bilirubin level of less than or equal to 3 mg per deciliter. If the bilirubin levels are at 7 mg per deciliter or above, the neonate is then classified as jaundice. About 30 to 50% of newborns get diagnosed with jaundice, and an even higher percentage if the jaundice is in the preterm newborn. This process starts with the red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen and nutrients throughout the body and are manufactured in the bone marrow. These cells have a life cycle of 120 days in adults, but only 90 days in the neonate. The life cycle of the red blood cell completes with the byproducts being excreted through the urine and feces. We can also see this appear in the coloration of bruises. You will know the eyes will be the first place that you will see unmistakable signs. The sclera has elastin, which is terribly attracted to bilirubin, giving the sclera the yellow appearance. This is a brief description of how jaundice or icterus works. The end stage of that life cycle is started with macrophages breaking down the red blood cells so that the body can get rid of them. This happens mainly in the spleen and the lymph. Hemoglobin is broken down into heme and globin. The globin part is easy for the body to sort out because it gets recycled to the body. The heme part, however, is further broken down into unconjugated bilirubin and iron. Again, the body has use for that iron, so it gets recycled. The unconjugated bilirubin, though, is toxic and cannot remain in the body. So it hitches a ride on albumin to the liver, where the liver adds some glucuronic acid to change it from a fat-soluble to a water-soluble substance so that the body can get rid of it. The water-soluble substance is called conjugated bilirubin. This conjugated bilirubin is stored in the gallbladder as bile, and then we eat and drink, and it slowly is released into the gut, and then again affected, but this time, by bacteria. The bacteria work at breaking down the conjugated bilirubin to urobilinogen, and then urobilin. The body can then excrete this as feces, where it shows up as the color of stools. Not every system is perfect though, so some of it goes back into the blood. In the blood, this is already water soluble, so the blood can get rid of even more through the kidney, where it shows in the urine as the yellow color. The rest goes back into the liver and gets to go through the entire process again. Now that we've gone through what should happen, we will discuss the things that could prevent that from going as planned. We'll be walking through this list one item at a time to encourage you to develop nursing care interventions for the problems that we identify. There can be increased red cell mass. This is seen in some hemolytic conditions. The most common is polycythemia, which is often attributed to post-maturity. The high concentrations of red blood cells also means that there is a higher number of cells reaching the end of their life cycle or being destroyed. This then puts strain on the system to process the bilirubin that results from that breakdown. This leads us to the second, short red cell lifespan. The faster they die, the faster the body will have to work to break the red blood cells down. Sometimes it is just not able to keep up. Then there is the slower uptake of bilirubin by the liver. 
the liver plays a huge role in this process. It is not only responsible for receiving unconjugated bilirubin, but it also releases that bilirubin in conjugated form to the bile duct. The lack of intestinal bacteria to break down conjugated bilirubin prevents the conversion from a fat to water-soluble substance. Therefore, it makes it difficult for the body to get rid of bilirubin and feces, which causes it to circulate back into the bloodstream. Finally, there's the issue of hydration. This process is dependent upon the conversion of bilirubin from fats to liquid form so that it can be excreted. The better hydrated the neonate is, the better able to discharge the bilirubin through the urine. In summary, we have highlighted four areas where this process can go wrong. Let's talk about physiological versus pathologic. Physiologic jaundice has a peak serum bilirubin level of less than 15 mg per deciliter and a total rise in bilirubin of less than 5 mg per deciliter. Pathologic jaundice meets and exceeds both these values. Pathologic neonatal jaundice occurs when there are additional factors accompanying the basic mechanisms of jaundice. This means if it is jaundice as a result of a change in the neonate, it's physiological. If there is some external contributing factor, it is pathological or has a root cause. This is a useful guide for differential diagnosis of a cause of jaundice based on the time of diagnosis and whether it has been determined to be conjugated or unconjugated at the source. The American Academy of Pediatrics Subcommittee on Hyperbilirubinemia notes that the most important aspect of the assessment of jaundice in any patient is to determine whether the hyperbilirubinemia is unconjugated, indirect reacting, or conjugated, direct reacting. Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is prehepatic in nature, whereas conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is the result of hepatocellular dysfunction or intra or extra hepatic biliary obstruction. Nursing interventions will take you back to pathophysiology of jaundice. In order to prevent jaundice, you want to initiate early breastfeeding and be sure to assess each neonate thoroughly throughout the shift. Education is important for both parents and in many cases the family as well. It may be to get them on the same page about breastfeeding or simply to engage them in monitoring of the child. Follow-up with the patient is very important, whether it is following up throughout institutional care or ensuring that the parents take the child to the clinic for routine care and immunizations. You may come across the Kramer scale or rule. All babies should be visually assessed for jaundice at every opportunity. Kramer's rule describes the relationship between serum bilirubin levels and the progression of skin discoloration. One of the most commonly used methods of reducing bilirubin levels is the use of phototherapy. This can be of a natural source or by way of fluorescent lights. Therapy is usually initiated when the newborn bilirubin exceeds 12 mg per deciliter and does not cease until it is down to 10 mg per deciliter. Practices between individual practitioners and institutions may vary. It is important to impress upon parents that they are not required to do this. It can damage the neonate's tender skin with a sunburn and lead to dehydration. As a culture, we often misinterpret the treatment of jaundice with sunlight as a need to expose the neonate to direct sunlight for extended periods of time. Encourage exposures of 10 to 15 minutes without direct sunlight. When treating a child under a billy light, be sure to place the light as close as 12 to 18 inches away from the body. Phototherapy is used to treat jaundice by lowering the bilirubin levels in the blood through a process called photooxidation. Photooxidation adds oxygen to the bilirubin so it dissolves easily in water. Keep the eyes covered. Prolonged exposure to the light rays can cause damage to the retina. Keep the gonads covered as there is evidence that the combination of hyperbilirubinemia and phototherapy 
can produce DNA strand breakage and other effects on cellular genetic material. This is based on a published paper by Hansen in 2017. Those studies have been done in animals that indicate that this may not actually be the case. It is noted that since this practice can lead to infertility, it's best to take the precaution. Because the neonate is left under the light to get maximum exposure, they will be dressed with the least amount of clothing possible. With that, it is important to monitor vitals, especially the temperature when caring for these neonates. Closely monitor intake and output since dehydration can adversely affect the body's ability to excrete bilirubin. According to Hansen in 2017, in neonates, fluid supplementation is tailored to the infant's individual needs as measured through evaluation of weight curves, urine output, urine-specific gravity, and fecal water loss. We also closely monitor fecal material since one of the side effects of phototherapy is loose green stools. Which brings us to just that, side effects. When caring for a child under phototherapy, you must look out for water loss, green stools, and bronze baby syndrome where the bilirubin is conjugated. Phototherapy will not be effective in these cases as the cause of the bronzing of the skin is uncertain. Now finally, a side effect is abnormal temperature changes which is related to insensible heat loss and light positioning. Along the lines of medication, phenobarb in certain circumstances is used as an inducer of hepatic bilirubin metabolism. That generally means that it helps to break down bilirubin in the liver. Metalloporphins basically increase the catalyzation of heme and work to enhance the breakdown of red blood cells. Indications for exchange transfusions include rapidly increasing serum bilirubin levels and hemolysis despite aggressive phototherapy. For exchange transfusion, fresh whole blood is typed and cross-matched to the mother's serum. The amount of the donor is usually double that of the infant's blood volume, which is approximately 85 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. The double volume exchange transfusion replaces approximately 85% of the neonate's blood. An exchange transfusion is a sterile surgical procedure. A catheter is inserted into the umbilical vein and threaded into the inferior vena cava. Depending on the infant's weight, 5 to 10 ml of blood is withdrawn within 15 to 20 seconds, and the same volume of donor blood is infused until the target volume, which is the estimated blood volume, is reached. It is then replaced with a compatible blood. Most often, it's Rh negative. Group O is also commonly used for exchange transfusions in hemolytic diseases of the newborn regardless of the blood group of the baby. The exchange blood transfusion process can take from one to four hours. Thank you guys for hanging in there. I look forward to doing your next unit. You can find the links to this video series in the description section below. Also feel free to jump to the time markers as they are also listed in the description section.